the light weather with Diane Oxbury. Well, it's unlikely this day will ever get any better. We've got an enormous bank of cloud bringing a huge band of rain smack over the top of us now, and there's an awful lot more to come as you head through the day. The wind is brisk. It's from the east. These conditions just keep on coming, and your top temperature depressed as we are 15 Celsius. It said in the mail we're going to get a month's rain today. Do they mean last month or next month? Because we've already had last month. Belongs to Bezik. Alan Bezik. I don't. BBC Radio Manchester. I often don't understand. <laughs> a month's rain in a day. I know. That doesn't matter. There's a place. Now, where is it? Oh, crikey. Why do you start these sentences when you don't know where they end? Think before you speak. I'm just thinking before I speak. It's not helping. Th there's a place. There are, it was on QI the other... Well, it might not have been. It was, but it might not have been, if you follow me. It might not have been the other night, because I think I was watching a recording of it, but it was on QI, where, where, we, where, where we garnishers of useless information gather together around the televisions. Not, not in one home, obviously, all around the country, uh, and watch grown men and women show off, basically. See, now wrong with that? Anyway, yeah. The, there's a place somewhere in the world, and I've forgotten where, where it hasn't rained for four centuries or something. So we could have their month, couldn't we? We could have a month of their weather in a day. That wouldn't bother us at all. We might get a bit, you know, fed up. Because you get, even now, if we get five days of sunshine, reservoirs will be empty, we'll be knackered again. Anyway, what am I doing talking about the weather? I don't care about the weather. I work indoors. Morning sound better with Eamon O'Neill and Diane Oxbury. Eamon and Diane. King Kev seems to have disappeared. What do you mean I ought to chuck me short in the time? Why doesn't he just sell up, man? Sell up. Right, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and then this was a full of I'm going to have this kind of sick of words. Right, like us with you now. <laughs> Eamon and Diane and you. There was a weird orange diamond light in the sky. A um, orange diamond. I would have said the size of an aeroplane. The station with Eamon and Diane for breakfast. I've no idea what you're talking about, man. Back Monday morning at 6 at BBC Radio Manchester. Well, the United Nations, isn't it? Marilyn in Timperley. Hiya, Marilyn. Hello. What can we do for you? Uh, well, uh, we have a problem in that I have an 18-year-old who left school in July and started working uh, part-time uh, in the box office at this uh, travelling show, Africa, Africa, in Manchester, in Trafford Centre. Um, and he, there's a, a slight dilemma because the people that are actually employing the young workers are German and don't speak much English. And uh, after he'd been there about a week, um, somebody came over from Germany and gave them a contract to sign. And they were told that they would get paid 20 hours for the hours that they did um, as per contract and anything else would be paid in cash. So far, and the rest of it will be put in his bank. So far, he's been told three or four dates of when the payments are going to be made into the bank, and he's had to, had to ask for two advances on his wages because he hasn't had regular wages. And this is now going on six weeks. They finish tour at the weekend. He's working today and tomorrow, and he still can't get any definite um, time or a date or whatever of when he's going to get paid. Well, it's it's tricky. Yeah, I it's know. It's very very tricky because um, he needs he needs to give them a letter yeah. saying that he wants his pay. Otherwise, he'll have to start thinking about taking them to court. Yes, he's he's threatened them with that today, actually. In writing. In verbally. Yeah. Well, he need he needs to put that in writing. But frankly, he needs to find out where the head office of the organisation is in the UK, ideally. Yeah. It yeah. might be worth him. It might be worth him talking to the. I mean, I ask just in passing. I know the answer. There isn't a trade union, is there? No. 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 They're um, all uh, youngsters. There's about yeah, well, five of them. Their age, their age isn't relevant. What's no. relevant is their casual workers. Yes. Yes. 
and frankly, it's very difficult to get your money as a casual worker if if they don't make it readily available, as it were. I know, that's what... It's, it's worth his while getting in touch with the employment department. Yeah. If, he, if he goes on to the... When he comes home, if you get him to go onto the website yeah. and uh, get in touch there with the Department of Employment on the website, they, they will give him... I mean, they will tell him... That website will tell him all the different things that he's entitled to and the remedies available to him if the if they don't do, if the company don't do what they're required to do. I'm sure they will in the end, but if mm. they don't, it'll tell him what he needs to do. But basically, in his position, it's almost certainly take them to the courts. Yeah, well, it if looks they don't like it because they're, they're, they're being very seriously well, sweet about well, it. Oh, we'll get in well, touch with Germany today. We'll do it today. Well, I mean, they, it may well be that they're attempting to resolve it. Yes. These things are complicated in the extreme. So, yes. they, I mean, basically, he needs to make sure that they know that he's going to take them to court. He may, gets as much information as he can whilst they're still on the premises. Yeah, finds they out move off on the premises. Well, of course they do. They're a touring shop. Sunday so he finds, out, he finds out where their headquarters is, who it is that's employing him. That's what he needs to know more well, than anything. Well, that's what Don't, we're trying to find out. Well, you said, he was, difficult. you said he was given a contract to sign. Was he given a copy of it? No, he was told a copy right. would be sent through the post, which hasn't materialised. Well... If he only signed it the other day, that's, yeah, that's hardly that's surprising. Needs he needs to find out who it is that is employing him. Right. That's the most important thing, because that is who's responsible to pay him. Yeah. And he needs to find that out. He needs to find that out today. Yeah. He needs also to ask for a copy of his contract. Yeah. OK? Yeah. All right, Madeline. OK, thank you very much All for All right, 0161228 Anybody else has been put in that position and uh, has any way of helping Marilyn, do give us a call, 0161228255. Email address, usual one, Radio Manchester at bbc.co.uk and the text number 07862069519. Hayden in Denton. Hi, Hayden. Oh, good afternoon, Alan. It's just to reiterate something. I was on the phone right at the tail end of yesterday, but I couldn't get to you. So what it is... Uh, Right near the tail end, there was a chap, I think he was from Macclesfield somewhere, bemoaning the fact, I think he said about travelling on the buses and trains or something, how, how bad it is, and it's, you know, as an alternative to using your car. Could you remember what is that? I, I can't remember it. Good Lord, it was yesterday. Oh, I know. Um, the, 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 fella, the fella I think you're referring to... Um, he was right near the end of the programme. Well, the, the last person I spoke to was talking about the lottery. The bloke before that was Terry. He was talking about the congestion charge and he was complaining that he had a bus pass or he will be entitled ah, to a bus right. pass, but he's not allowed to use his bus pass on the tram, is what he was saying, because uh, we had some fun at his expense saying, well, the tram doesn't go to Macclesfield. think that was the one where he can use it on the tram. He can, can he? he, he can you can use your bus pass. If, you've got, if you're the holder of a bus pass... Your bus pass entitles you to travel on the bus, on the train, and on the metro, free of charge. Well, hang on a minute. We, we need to distinguish here. The Are we talking... Are you talking there about the national bus pass, the bus pass that yes. you can... Yeah. Yes, that you receive when you're 60. So that... that if that's what he was in possession of, then that's what he can do. Mm-hmm. He, if he's in possession of the National Bus Pass, within, his, within the perimeters of Manchester, he can travel on bus, train... No, you, you see, the problem here is... ...and metro. <laughs> I'm, I need to check that. The reason I ask is the, the bus pass that one is entitled to allows people all over the country... Yes. In other words, if your bus pass is issued in Manchester, you are allowed to use your bus pass for free off-peak local bus travel yes. using the National Bus Pass. Yes. That's what it entitles you to, uh, bus in, in all travel. areas in England? Yes, indeed. But it's, it's off-peak bus travel. Yeah, it, it's, it's from 9.30 Monday to Friday. No, we're not talking about the times. That'll confuse us. Well, what okay, we're talking then. about is what does it permit you to travel right, on. Well, and the National Bus Pass and allows you to travel off-peak on a local bus yes. anywhere in England. Yes. Now, listen to that. Yeah. A local Hello. bus anywhere in England. It makes no mention of the tram. No, it doesn't. It makes no mention of the underground. No. It allows you to travel on yeah. the bus. Yes, 
I know that, but what I said to you was, within the Manchester area... Well, he's in Macclesfield, he's not yeah, in... but he's in Greater Manchester. No, he's not. He's not? Well, I'm sorry, well, I didn't know it ended. That's in Cheshire. Right. Macclesfield well, is in Cheshire. Well, all I can tell you is that if I was going to Macclesfield now, or uh, to Macclesfield now, I would travel into Stockport and I would get the train from Stockport to Macclesfield, which I have done, and I've not been charged. Well, that's fine, but... Um, I mean, <laughs> he's saying that he he believes he's not allowed to use it on the Greater what? Manchester other public transport right. than buses. No, he can. He can use it. If he's in possession of the, the, the pass which he issued to you over 60, he can use trains, buses and metro links within the Man Greater Manchester area. I can travel for yes, years well, on, let, on the train. Let me ask you this. Yes. Simple question. Somebody from Southampton yes. who has the National Bus Pass, yes. are they entitled to use the trams in Manchester? No. Why not? They can use the local bus No, I'd never mind what with. they can use. No, they My can. question was, why can't they? I don't know. I'll tell you why. Because the National Bus Pass allows you to use buses. If you're outside your area, yeah. inside your area, some of the local authorities allow you to use stuff, allowed you to use transport other than buses, but the entitlement gr granted by the bus pass is the right to use buses. So yeah. if your pass is issued outside of Greater Manchester, yeah, it only entitles you to use buses. Yes, I understand that. Now, I Macclesfield... Now, so if that's outside the Greater Manchester area, then he's correct. Well, he is correct. That's yeah, the whole he's point. he's correct up to a certain point. Exactly the point he made is what he's correct on. Is that he would have to pay from Macclesfield and then where were the Greater no, Manchester... Listen to what he was... There is no tram to Macclesfield. We're back no, having the comments. No, the He's talking is. about the tram. He well, mentioned the tram. He said, I can't use my pass on the tram. No. Now, my question to you is, can he? Yes. No, he can't. Why can't he use it on the metro? But like you established earlier, he can't use... If he, if he was issued with his pass in Southampton, he wouldn't be allowed to travel on the metro with it, would he? Right. Would he? No. Why? I've been through this before, but I'll go through it again. Why? Because it's, it's only issued if they travel in Manchester. No, it's up. No, listen. If he was issued with his bus pass, his national bus yeah. pass in Southampton, yeah. would he be entitled to travel on the tram in Manchester? No. Why? Because it's a bus pass. It's a bus pass issued outside Greater Manchester. Yes? Do you agree? Yeah. Just stand right. a minute, Alan. No, I've not got time. Uh, Ray in Bellevue. Uh, Hiya. Hello, Alan. Nice to speak to you. And you. Thank you. Well, I, I must say, I do like the Caribbean and West Indian peoples. I, I was brought up in Old Trafford near Moss Side. But uh, I'm just saying about... Uh, now, there was a Caribbean carnival in August. Uh, I, I'm not sure if it was Moss Side or Hume, but my attention was drawn to it by a letter in the Manchester Evening News, an anonymous letter, in which the person said he felt as though that it was unfair that they had been sub subjected to searches. Under, he believed it was under the stop and search, a new law. Well, it might have been in for a few years now, but... The thing is uh, that uh, he was amazed when the person in front of him was was asked, "Could they pick? Uh, could they search uh, their baby's nappy?" Uh, and also, he, the person said that uh, was a stop and search at the Mila festival. I think that's for the eight people of Asian origin or of descent, and also at the Mardi Gras in Manchester. So I thought I'd bring... I'd like to say that I think it's unfair myself. I, I know that uh, uh, weapons... Uh, there is a lot of knife crime, but, uh, no, I, I think I think I agree with the letter writing myself, Alan. What is it you're agreeing with? Uh, when well, I, I agree... Are you that saying that th there should not be stop and search? Well, I was... On, I got the impression from the letter, and I could be wrong, 
I thought it was of people going through a gate or something. And uh, now uh, it, uh, I, 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 I feel as though there might be a stigma uh, attached to the Caribbean peoples, thinking that a lot of crime is uh, knife crime is connected with them. Where well, it, it, it happens in all in all races, doesn't it, Alan? In in well, knife crime is no uh, no respecter of nationality. That's for sure. Knife crime exists all over the place, but. Uh, I'm just wondering what it is you're you're objecting to. You're objecting to well, stop and yeah. search full stop, or just the implication, because the, the correspondent you quoted doesn't seem to know, that only the Caribbean carnival was had stop and search. It may well be there was stop and search used at all the others. I don't know. No, I, well... I, I, I wasn't at any of them, so I'm not no, in a position I, I to say. No, I wasn't, but uh, I know on the television when they watched the BBC local news and... ITV's local news that uh, it didn't say there was any stop and searches at the at the at the Mardi Gras. No. But uh, I think that uh, that uh, the Caribbean peoples uh, now they might. I think that there is racism in our society, but I'm not saying it's very strong. I'm, I'm not really sure. Tell you the truth, I know right. that the the fascist BMP are. Uh, uh, getting quite a, a lot of votes and they're getting council elected and I don't like that myself. All right, mate. Well, good on you, Ray. Uh, we've got to go because we've got the headlines to do, but thank, thank you. you very much indeed. Ray says that uh, certain groups of our society should not be singled out for stop and search or indeed for any other kind of selective measures. He's got a point, has he not? It's just gone 20 past 12 on BBC Radio Manchester. Anna Dawson's got the headlines. An ex-Manchester City trainee goalkeeper who blackmailed a top Premier League footballer has been jailed for 20 months. 22-year-old Ashley Tims from Middleton demanded £15,000 from the star who can't be named. The mother of Shannon Matthews, the nine-year-old girl from Dewsbury who disappeared for three weeks in February, has appeared in court and pleaded not guilty to charges of kidnap and false imprisonment as well as perverting the course of justice. And Fred Dibner's Bolton home has failed to sell at auction. It was up yesterday with a guide price of between £250 and £300,000. Manchester's weather rain continuing this afternoon. High of 15 Celsius. A big hole in the garden. Shouldn't be able to give it away. CBC Radio Manchester. 2020 traffic. Seems to be the wet weather that's taking its toll on a lot of the traffic today. Uh, not doing too badly now, actually. A lot of areas have eased and are looking a lot better, but it's looking very slow on the cameras between junctions 20 at Lim and ni uh, 17, actually, it is now. So it's Sandbatch on the M6 southbound. So if you're heading down from junction 20 at Lim down towards junction 17 at Sandbatch, looking very slow at the moment. It's the heavy rain that's caused that queue. No accidents and no incidents. In Manchester, just a quick reminder that Peter Street is still closed to traffic because of the roadworks. It's along that whole stretch. If you're heading towards D Gate. Uh, from the Midland Hotel, that area there, you can't get any further. Farmworth, we've got delays today. Albert Road, and that's near to Harraby Street. Temporary lights there, only till 3.30, and then they're clear. Anything else, you can give me a call. It's 0161244951. I'm Warner Merchant. Decongesting Manchester, one car at a time. 2020 traffic. I'm worn out now. NH in Tameside says... Only holders of GM passes can use the railway and the metro in Greater Manchester. GM passes are not valid on railways outside Greater Manchester, except Glossop, he says, for some reason. Well, the reason being that that's what he believes, but you know what I mean. Um, so we get back to the point. The converse is also true. Passes issued outside Greater Manchester are valid for use on bus journeys. <sighs> Seems hard. Good afternoon, Alan. Thank you. Thank you. This comes from Colin in Bolton. He says, further to your view that it would be unreasonable for countries with power to impose on states because they are not democratic. It's my contention, says Colin, that the same principle should be applied to believe that our country shouldn't respond to invasions against British colonies, for example, the Falklands, the Channel Islands, Gibraltar, and so on. I comment from the perspective of 
considering a citizen's right to remain British and not be suppressed by a harsh regime or forcibly introduced to a strange culture rather than the objective of maintaining a commodity of value like oil. It is a tricky one, isn't it? The people of the Falklands, undoubtedly, undoubtedly, the people of the Falklands, almost, almost to a man and woman, want to be part of the UK. They want to be. They, they do. That's it. They want to be British, if you like. The same applies almost, almost, yeah, no, I don't think, it, yeah, very nearly. I think, I think it's about 98% or something. That, that's almost everybody, isn't it, in Gibraltar. The Channel Islands, I don't think, have given it much thought because they're close enough to be protected and so don't have to worry about it, so worry about other things like is the big monster next door bossing us about. So, yes, those two groups, the Channel Islands, slightly different, very slightly different in that they have no desire to be British, indeed have no desire to be French. They have a desire to be Channel Islanders, I think is the answer, I'm not sure. But the Falklands and Gibraltar are very special cases. But we then have to wonder, in the end, surely justice has to prevail. Now, it's a bit early, because it's full of corpses in uniform, isn't it, the Falklands, after it was taken back violently from Argentina. Gibraltar, um, the corpses are less recent, but Gibraltar's been at loggerheads with Spain for some time. And when you look at a map of Spain, you would wonder why Portugal, for that matter, is Portugal and not Spain, let alone Gibraltar. But that's, that's a slightly different argument, isn't it? But you would wonder. Um, but, but, yeah, I mean, the problem is, what, what do you do? What do you do if, if, if those people want to be British? Does that mean we have to let them? And what happens if, for example, some other country decides, well, frankly, we've had a vote and we'd rather be British. So, all right, well, you can be British then. So now the British Army will have to come and defend you. The Falklands is only British because some bloke took it over years ago. I can't remember who, but years and years ago. And, frankly, has been, it's been British ever since. It's been a constant, constant source of argument. And I, th I think the solution to the Falklands is exactly the same as happened in Hong Kong. And that is, we should negotiate with Argentina over, well, over the position of uh, sovereignty of the Falklands and say, well, all right, We'll have it, the UK will continue to rule it, continue to see it as part of the UK, as part of Britain, if you like, Greater Britain, for the next, we can pick a date, it doesn't matter, but a century at least, 150 years perhaps, and say, so for the next 150 years, it will be British. We reserve the right to rule it and operate it and take the profit from it, if you will. And the Argentine gets it after 150 years, like with Hong Kong. Now, everybody predicted that when China took over Hong Kong, Hong Kong would be raised, basically. The buildings would be dropped to the floor, and the economy would be dropped to the floor. But no, China has dealt with Hong Kong in what most people I talk to think was a perfectly reasonable way. And I think the same could be done with the, conf with the Falklands. And that way, we avoid the risk of future, should we say, wars, skirmishes. Because we will have ceded, we will have ceded to Argentine sovereignty and say, okay, we accept it's your sovereignty, but we, we retain absolute control of it for the next 150 years. Now, if the argument is about minerals and the like, then it is not beyond the ingenuity of man certainly not beyond the ingenuity of diplomats to work out some process, some, some divide process, so that we say, OK, for the, first, for the first 20 years, everything that comes out the sea around the Falklands is British-owned. And then after the next 20 years, it's, I don't know, 
the next 20 years, it's 60-40. You see where I'm going. You get equal. And then slowly but surely, it's taken over by the Argentine. Maybe, maybe that's the way. I don't know. But certainly, having it as a thorn in the side of Argentine is, frankly, not good for the people of the Falklands, not good for the economy of the Falklands, not good for the British government. If, if the Argentinians moved into the Falklands now, they would get it. They would win. They would win because our soldiers are dying somewhere else. So, yeah, I do still hold the view that defending things with guns rarely, rarely provides security. Colin in Bolton. If you have a view on that, I, I'd love to hear it. 01612282255. What we do know is that if, if the squaddies come back from Iraq, Afghanistan, Germany, there's still a few out there, apparently. Ireland, there's still one or two there. Or indeed the Falklands, where they might be half a dozen, I don't know. But if they do come back, there's a certain hotel in the country that until yesterday they wouldn't have been allowed into. I refer to this story in the newspapers today of a soldier injured hero as he's described in the mail they like that sort of thing in the mail injured hero barred from a hotel just because he's a soldier it's the metro hotel and it's not around here don't worry we, we wouldn't do that it's in woking in surrey and he went to that part of the world to organize a funeral of a friend killed in action and he needed to stay overnight so he booked into an hotel and when he arrived to take up his room late in the evening 2200 hours in his language 10 o'clock to you and me when he arrived late in the evening they said well okay thank you very much have you any identification he shows his military identity card and they say oh i'm sorry you can't stop here we don't allow soldiers we don't allow soldiers that's what they said last night his mother Gaynor was absolutely outraged at the treatment of her son who's a corporal and he's back actually now in afghanistan he serves with the 3rd Air Assault Support Regiment of the Royal Logistic Corps, based in Colchester. He's now back on the front line fighting in Helmand Province. Joined the army at 16, served in Iraq before being posted to Afghanistan. His father, Philip, is a retired printer. I don't know the relevance of that, but he is, who served three years with the Royal Horse Artillery, called for a change in the law to prevent something similar happening in the future. Well, that's the bit I have trouble with. I think it's outrageous that the hotel did not allow one soldier to stay there. One soldier is not likely to do any harm. Not likely. I'm not sure I'd be comfortable as a hotelier if ten of them turned up and they were on their stag weekend. I wouldn't be that keen. I'm sorry, I wouldn't. I've been on stag weekends as a sort of... The stag on this occasion is not... <laughs> it's not stag when you're on duty, when you're on guard. That's called stag as well. But this is, you know, a stag night in the more... the non-military sense. And I've been on them when I was a squaddy. And frankly, not many hoteliers would have been pleased. So if we create the right for a soldier, sailor, air person, if we create the right for such a member of the armed forces to stay in hotels in other words they cannot be discriminated against do we not injure that which the military are said to be fighting for the military are said to be fighting for our freedom well surely it is the freedom it is the right of a hotelier to decide who will and who will not stay in his accommodation now there are certain things that are not allowed, certain kinds of discrimination, racial, sexual, uh, and one or two others, I'm led to believe. And they're, I suppose, curtailments of the freedom, but they're curtailment that everybody accepts. But should... I, I can see that certain hotels wouldn't allow groups of rugby players to stay in their hotels. Football players, all sorts of groups of people who, frankly, you wouldn't want ten of them. So it's very dangerous to say you must allow them to stay there. So, yes, by all means, by all means, have a rule that says we're not going to have a group of squaddies or, a, or any, any large groups of people, male or female, because M parties are just as bad these days. But to make a law that says every member of the armed forces has the right to stay 
in a premise if it has vacancies and, and is open for trade is, in my view, somewhat dangerous. What do you say? Jackie in St Helens. Hi, Jackie. Hello, Alan. It's me again. Hello, it's you again. <laughs> uh, well, I was thinking, could he not just have turned around and said he was gay and then they couldn't have discriminated against him? Well, they, get, they could. If they, if they have a rule that says no soldiers, then no, they couldn't then say... Well, I did see an, uh, an article where somebody had turned away two people who wanted to st stay in the same room of the same sex. And they were in trouble. They were taken to court. Well... It's a little while ago now. It, it's, about, it's about seven or eight months ago, if I remember. Yes. Yeah. A fellow with a moustache, I seem to remember. Well, I, don't, I, don't, I have I don't no idea that I bit. remember <laughs> that, but I seem to remember that the hotelier had a moustache for some reason. <laughs> but, but that's not the point, is it? Because if, the, if they say to him, we are not allowing you to stay here because we do not allow soldiers, and he says, well, I'm gay, and they say, yes, but you're a gay soldier, and it's soldiers we're not allowing. Well, I don't know. Well, I mean, yes, you can. You can discriminate against people who are gay, unless, un well, you can't discriminate against people who are gay, unless, of course, you are discriminating against them prior to that for a, a permissible reason. In other words, they say we don't allow soldiers. Full stop. Well, I'm a black soldier. Okay. I'm a gay soldier. I'm black and gay. Yes, but you're a soldier. It's soldiers we're not allowing. Oh. Well, I, I disagree with it anyway, like, like well, you said. Well, absolutely. I, I think well, it's wrong, yeah. It is wrong, but, but equally, these soldiers are out there said to be putting their lives on the line, defending our freedom. Surely our freedom includes the freedom to say, this is my place and you're not stopping in it. Well, it's like uh, so many people keep saying about being in America. I mean, we were in America when they went to uh, Iraq and that. And we were driving down to Boston, and we saw so many stars and stripes that I said, if I never see another one, I'll, it'll be too soon. Because every garden, every bridge had one each side, you know, and every building had them on for the soldiers who'd gone to Iraq. Yeah, and, and good luck to them. Well, that's it. But, I mean, it was just that it became a bit overwhelming. But, I mean, we, we go to places, and we go to one... Watertown, which is quite near a big base called mm. Fort Drum. Yeah. And you do see them wandering around in their fatigues. Isn't that what they call them? They do indeed call them campsite. fatigues, yeah. They see them. And people are, you know, quite happy to see them and, you know, there's no dispute at all. There's, n there's mm. no ill feeling or anything. Uh, and I think it's so. ridiculous. Well, it depends. Again, there, w there was an article round about the time you're talking about the, the chap who wouldn't allow two same-sex people to sleep in the same bedroom. There was an article at one of the barrack camps, as it were, one of the barrack towns, and I think it, I think it was Aldershot, but I could be wrong, where landlords were complaining that hordes of drunken soldiers were wrecking the joints. Now, I think that's the army's responsibility. Well, it to is... To get hold of them and shake them and say, the don't do this. It is the army's responsibility, but it's no good if you're, if you're there with your chairs broken and your windows yeah. broken and your furniture broken and your glasses broken, saying, well, it's OK, the army will sort it out. What you say is you just had 20 squaddies in here and we're not having any more. Yeah, I appreciate because that. Because they've wrecked the joint. But the other thing I wanted to speak to you about was I don't really agree with you over Hong Kong and the Falklands. Go on, tell me why. Well, Hong Kong was a slightly different thing because it was ceded for a given period, wasn't it? Well, that's what I'm suggesting for yeah, the Falklands. Yeah, but the Falklands isn't in the same thing. It was not ceded for so long. It was um, obtained, mm -hmm. as most land was, and has been kept ever since. And a lot of it's, it's position uh, to the Antarctic. Well, I'm aware of the reason, uh, there are a number of reasons all related to its position. One is the suspicion that there are minerals around there. Uh, another reason is that um, they want access to the fishing grounds. Yeah. And the third one, not necessarily in that order, you rightly say, it is a staging post for the Antarctic. And Great Britain would have no other access to Antarctic without it. Yeah. So, yes, there are lots of strategic reasons, however we still have to look at the reasonableness of that and consider how we deal with it if we perceive it to be unreasonable. Well, uh, it's just that I didn't think that the comparison was quite the same because the, the position of Hong Kong had been thus from when its inception, wasn't it? Indeed. I, um, the comparison I was offering was there was a piece of land surrounded, for want of a better term, by 
a larger nation yeah. claiming it owned it. Yeah. And we said, no, you don't, we do. That's the parallel. The reasons it came to that position, I grant you, are different. But given the parallel of the dispute, we can find a similar way through that, if we want to find it. Oh, well, you see, I, I still believe if they're British, they're British. And uh, I, find it, I feel it is our responsibility. Because if I was over there, I would not want to feel that they were going to give me away. Indeed, but they're not giving you away if we look at it and say, well, hang on a minute, we're talking about 150 years hence. Yeah, I know, but... They'll not be right bothered. And in fact, in <laughs> 150 years, things can change <laughs> of their own volition. We might have world government by then and it'll all be irrelevant. But you must agree with me that it is utterly ridiculous that a full stop on the southern tip of Spain is said to be Britain. Dean. I don't really know. I've never been... I've never been to the Falklands, but I know people who have. <laughs> but I've never been to Gibraltar, but uh, I believe there's not a lot there. There's not a lot there, just a load of pubs selling Watney's Red Barrel and people oh, strutting that? about, uh, uh, not quite in bowler hats, but, but sort of emotionally strutting about in a bowler hat. Oh. Never mind, give it back to the monkeys, say I. Good on you, Jackie. <laughs> Have a good weekend. Thank you. Bye. And I know they're not monkeys, they're apes. It's 19 minutes to 1 o'clock on BBC Radio Manchester. Anna Dawson's got the news headlines. An ex-Manchester City trainee goalkeeper who blackmailed a top Premier League footballer has been jailed for 20 months. 22-year-old Ashley Timms from Middleton demanded £15,000 from the star who can't be named for legal reasons. The mother of Shannon Matthews, the nine-year-old girl from Dewsbury who disappeared in February, has appeared in court and pleaded not guilty to charges of kidnap and false imprisonment as well as perverting the course of justice. And Fred Dibner's Bolton home has failed to sell at auction. It was up yesterday with a guide price of between £250 and £300,000. Manchester's weather rain continuing this afternoon. Highs of 15 Celsius. BBC Radio Manchester. 2020 traffic. Well, the wet weather taking its toll at the moment on the motorway network. So the M6 looking very slow on that southbound side between junctions 20 at Lim and 17, all the way down to Sunbatch at junction 17 there. It's looking slow on the camera images, but there are no accidents and no incidents. It's just the heavy rain and the wet weather. That's it, really. Everything else seems to be pretty much OK. We've had no further accidents or incidents today. If you do spot anything else, you can always give me a call. It's 0161 4951. I'm Warner Merchant. BBC Radio Manchester. Sports with Steve White. Hello, good afternoon to you again. There'll be no play before lunch on day three of Lancashire's game up at Durham. A day's worth of play has already been lost to the weather at the Riverside and there's been another delay this morning with the home side still on 280 for three. Uh, the prospects for the rest of the day come from Chris Maliband. A grim three days in the northeast for Lancashire. Just the one bonus point in the 95 overs that we have played as their bowlers could just take three wickets. Two of them were run outs. It looks inevitable draw here in Chesterley Street. There are puddles on the outfield getting ever deeper as the rain continues to fall here in the northeast. It's not confirmed yet, but an abandonment for today will surely come very soon. The forecast is barely better for the final day of this four-day game tomorrow or for the Pro 40 League game on Sunday where Lancashire are bottom of the Division 1 table. All in all, a pretty gloomy picture and Lancashire captain Stuart Law is certainly becoming mightily frustrated by the elements. Well, I'm sick of the rain. You know, it, at times, uh, I can understand why you know people do silly things to themselves in this part of the world when you spend winter in dark gloomy conditions and then during summer you very rarely get a you know a patch of blue sky and you know sunshine so uh, it, it's been frustrating it's been horrible well, Newcastle's management structure has been compared to an orchestra with three conductors. That's the view of the League Managers Association's Chief Executive, Richard Bevan. He was responding to a disillusioned Kevin Barker's decision, uh, Kevin Keegan's decision, rather, to resign as manager at St James's Park. After a whirlwind week of speculation about which Manchester City players uh, might find their way to the club in light of their new billions of pounds that they have to spend. Manager Mark Hughes says he hasn't actually been given a limit to his January transfer budget. The Blues' new owners broke the British transfer record to sign Rubinho on Monday, with Hughes saying their wealth may now see them spending over the odds. There isn't a limit. The key to it is, is that we'll try and get value if we can. Uh, but if we feel that the right player would be attainable and if we have to pay uh, maybe a little bit extra then we have the means to do that. But we will still look for value, we'll still look for uh, good young players that will 
will gain in value because I think that's that's the right thing to do. Meanwhile, Joey Barton has arrived at the Football Association to face a disciplinary hearing after pleading guilty to a charge of violent conduct. It follows a training ground assault on former teammate Usman Darbo when they were both with City. There's a grand finale to the Super League season locally this evening. St Helens will be awarded the League Leaders' Shield for a fourth year running, providing they avoid defeat. However, their opponents are, of course, arch-rivals Wigan. The Saints coach Daniel Anderson says his side aren't at their best, but come the game, they'll be ready. Everyone's still very tired emotionally and mentally, more tired than physically. You know, we spent seven days preparing for the Cup, but I can tell you, they might be a little bit foggy-eyed when they walk onto the field, but as soon as the whistle goes, we'll be OK. I will have commentary on Saints against Wigan. And news of Rochdale's playoff game at York in Manchester Sports from 7 o'clock this evening. And Sales' Andrew Sheridan and Rory Lamont face a late fitness test ahead of tomorrow's Premiership opener at Newcastle. However, Matthew Tate against his former club and Dwayne Peel will make their debuts. Sebastian Bruno, however, is ruled out with a knee injury. <laughs> The next live action on the Northwest's biggest sports station. Not hopeful, but fingers crossed we might have some cricket for you this afternoon as Lancashire take on Durham up at the Riverside. This evening we will have rugby league action for you. It's Saints against Wigan from 7 o'clock. BBC Radio Manchester. A very good day to you. Gordon says, I know Gibraltar, Gibraltar like the back of my hand as we have a place near there. What really gets my goat is the workers are all Spanish that go in and out like lemons twice a day. And they're not all Gibraltarians like they want to be. They're called, they're mostly bloody Spanish with British passports. Give it back! I don't think so, as it was and still is a listening post on the region for the USA. I mean, I mean the British. That's what it is. It is indeed. I, I, I have no way of knowing this, of course, having signed the Official Secrets Act on these matters, but I'm led to believe there is a listening station, and if you, if you look at the top of the hill, there are an awful lot of masts, and I don't think that they're checking the speed of the wind. But I say again, it still has no right. No right. And, uh, frankly... Anyway, there you go. Ah, but, Lawrence from Wigan, ah, but the Falklands allows us access to as yet undiscovered minerals in Antarctica. Hey, we won't be letting that go in a hurry, he says. Ah, you see, our politicians driven by the dollar again. How cruel, wicked and unsatisfactory is that? Terry in Macclesfield. Hiya, Terry. Oh, I want... Uh, good afternoon to you. I spoke to you yesterday, and, and thank you for putting that gentleman right about my bus pass. It was interesting. But I, the thing is, what's prompted you today is the fact that you mentioned about a serviceman not being allowed into a hotel. I did. Well, nothing's changed. I did... I, I, I'll repeat myself to you. You may remember, I did my uh, national service in the Royal Navy. And uh, my ship, the, on working up trials, went into Ros Ice pr pr prior to going to the nuclear bomb test in the Pacific. And once ashore, being a national serviceman, I used to stay as sure as long as possible. In those days, we used to get 27 shillings a week. And naturally, we couldn't afford to go into a hotel or even a doss house. So I, I was wandering around Edinburgh about two in the morning. It, it was pissing down with rain. I was frozen to bloody death. And I wandered onto Waverley Station. Went in the waiting room. It, it finally emptied and everybody got a train. And two, Royal, uh, sorry, two, na um, not, two British Rail Police, or it was rail then, walked in and said, where are you going? I said, nowhere. They said, well, you're not bloody staying in here. Out you go. So uh, I was escorted off the, the station, and then I wandered back in and got into a stationary um, passenger t uh, train. Just It was stationary. Yeah. I yeah. got into it to get out of the bloody rain. Yeah. And I was so soaked and wet and wet, I, I, I felt completely asleep. And then the next thing I remember, some doors were slamming and mine slammed, and there were people getting in. <laughs> <laughs> but I was in bloody Sterling. <laughs> and all I can say is nothing's changed but apart from walking out of the station at Sterling, I only got about 100 yards walking back towards Edinburgh, which was quite a considerable distance. <laughs> it's a fair to actually, yeah. And uh, um, 
A car stopped and said, where are you going to, Jack? I said, I'm trying to get back to my ship in Rosai. Jump in, we'll take you there. Yeah. That was it was, was like in the 50s. Well, there were different times, but, but it is interesting were. that even in that time, when people had a closer personal relationship with the military, because most men did national service, most yes. women knew men who did national service, were married to men who did national service, went out with men. There was a closer relationship with the military, but even then there were some people who said, I don't want one in my house. Uh, no, well, maybe, but anyway, well, what I could say is that, talking about the Falklands, I'll bore you there, I went to the Falklands, went to the bloody Gibraltar, crossed the line 14 times in the National Service, they can stick the Falklands, it's a crap hole, uh, but like that man said, it's full of minerals, especially oil, so we've got an interest there. <laughs> well, never mind, if ever we find that we've run out of fish, it also has a, a, a fairly substantial supply yeah. of penguins as well, so... But, but just, uh, uh, my mother's dead now, but last Falklands exercise, I took, I was down working in Plymouth, funnily enough, for an American company, and it was when um, a ship came back, HMS Broadsword, and my mother was on the hold. She says, "Isn't it a long, a long way, a long way, Terry?" I said, "Yes, ma'am." I said, "When I got to the Falklands Islands, I was more than halfway home." <laughs> <laughs> good on you, mate. All the best. Have a good day. Stop being a softy, bendy, surrendering coward," says Teddy Moston. He's never in danger of getting splinters in his bottom, is he, Ted? Because he's never on the fence. Stop being a soft, bendy, surrendering coward. The Falklands were never inhabited. Argentina did once own them, but they never set up a colony there. Argentina has no right to the Falkland Islands and should back down, or else they should be prepared to get their asses kicked again. John Thompson. He knows what he knows. Paradiddle is right, left, right, right. Left, right, left, left. Every day. Yeah, yeah. yeah. that's a parody in the background. Yeah. So if you sing it, I'll do it. Every day it's again faster. Try and listen to my beat, Sandy, that might help. <laughs> that's a parody John Thompson. He knows what he means. What's that for group? Scar. Special. Special. Scar. More special. Scar. More reggae. Special. Special. Call me like I go, Stomp. It's always very camp, though, guys. <laughs> do you remember the good old days before the ghost town? <laughs> John Thompson's take on the world. It's very, very low key. Tomorrow morning from 11 on BBC Radio Manchester. Stuff. John's with you tomorrow from 11, about to, about to do a bit in the Coronation Street as well. How the mighty have fallen, eh? And I, I'm here tomorrow, twixt six and nine, and you might as well know about the middle bit. The middle bit will, of course, be the delightful, you were listening to her this morning, the delightful, the magnificent Becky Want, out shopping again. Margaret in Berry, are you? Hi, Alan. You've never been to Gibraltar. I have. Oh, have you? Yeah. And so you saw everybody in bowler hats and it was full of monkeys no. or apes, as you Well, said. I didn't say they were in bowler hats at all. I said that they were emotionally in bowler hats. Strutting, Why? Well, strutting about performing their Britishness. Look at me, I'm British. Emotionally in a bowler hat. I, I didn't for one minute think or suggest that they were actually wearing... How long did you go for? Oh, just for the day. So you didn't see it at all? Well, I, I, didn't, no, I didn't go a day in a blindfold. It's only as big as... It's not as big as bloody Wigan. And most of that is an island. It's a, it's a dirty, great big mountain. I no, saw as much as I needed. But you you, all, you know, you're always caught... Every time you go on about Gibraltar, you're caught... And also, the man that, sent, that said he'd, he has a place in Spain, he said and a, a lot of... Um, most people in Gibraltar are Spanish. Well, how is it that 98% of them want to stay British? Well, what he said... And we uh, go two well, or I, three times what a he, year. What he, he said, it, what he said, because we, we've got to get the facts on what he said before you, you, you knock him down. What he said, most people who work there are Spanish. That's what he said. He yeah, even mentioned he, them going back into across yeah, the border. But, uh, and also, he said a lot of Spanish live there. Well, what he said was the Gibraltarians are Spanish with British passports. That's a slightly different thing than saying Spaniards live there. But you don't, you don't see a place in the day, and you won't spend a full. Well, how day long must I be there before I realise that it's just a full stop on the southern corner of Spain? How long do I need to look at what basically is a dirty great big rock, frankly? What did, do I need? Did you go up the rock? I went up as far as one is permitted, because there is a limit to how far you can go, because the military have the, the yes, very tip I know. of the well, rock, Well, we you know. go two or three times a year. How boring it, is that? 
Pardon? Well, how boring is that? Why in the name of God do you go there two or three times a year? Because it's a lovely, safe place. Well, it is and safe. I'll grant you it's safe. No yeah. question about And that. all religions get on together. Uh, I've all no idea. Them. And, but uh, is that your reason for going? No, we go oh. because we love it. Yeah? What do you like about it? Apart from its safety. Why do you go to France? Um, I like the when French... When it's full of frogs. You well, say it's full of monkeys. I, well, I, I like the French culture, is mm. the answer to that. And I like practising my rather poor French. And I like the French diet. And I like the French countryside. So there's my reasons. What are yours for... My, for, for the, um, uh, if we must have it, France generally is safe. But I did get burgled last time I went. Um, but we, loved, we love the Gibraltarian people. Why? Wh what about them? They're what very friendly. Mm. Yeah. All very friendly, mm. and each time we've been going a long, long time, people say, "Oh, it's just a, just a rock and one street, main street." It's not every much more than that, is it? Every time we go, we find something different. Well, yes, but you can do that in most towns in the United Kingdom. If you go once or twice or three times a year, you can. What, I, what, what I don't grasp because the, Gibraltar is this dirty, great big rock. And there is just... It's a dirty big rock. Well, it's a huge rock. You All would, right. But, you know, it, it is a big rock, isn't it? Can we agree on that? I know it's a big rock, right, but it's it, not a dirty big rock. Well, it's covered, it, it's covered in monkey crap, so it's perhaps quite dirty. Well, it but isn't. But whether, whether it's dirty or not, I, I was using dirty in the, in the descriptive sense... Monkeys don't go all over the rock anyway. No, they don't. Um, but, but most of the island is taken up by bits that you can't get to, for a start. Is it? It's not an island. Yes, it is. Oh. I mean, you, how often do you wander about the hillside? What do you mean, the hillside? The side of the hill. You've got a hill, it has a side on it. The side of the hill, hillside. We stay at the side of the rock. You stay at the side of the rock, yeah. yeah. How often do you wander across the hillside, was my question. At all? What do you mean, across? the hill. Uh, like, like, if you go to the Lake District and you go for a walk... Yeah, but we're hillside. not talking about the Lake District. No, I was asking. I, yes, lake. and I was trying to find out what it is you do there, but you're not helping me by pretending you don't know what a hillside is. But uh, what do you do when you're there? Oh, lots of things. Lovely walks to do. Right. And never very far away. No. OK. Well, you love, you love Gibraltar. Now, having said all that, and there's no reason why you shouldn't love it, as you rightly said, I love France. There are parts of France that I think are absolutely magnificent, but I have no desire for them to be British. Why do you think Gibraltar, which you love, should be British? I didn't say I think this should okay, be well British. OK, well, what I do you think? You're getting me wrong. Now. I am I indeed, and I apologise for that. So will you tell I me... I said the people want to stay British. Yeah. We go over there and do you we think it them. should? Do you think it should be British? I'm asking your opinion now. You don't have to give it if you don't want. Do you think it should be part of Britain? Yes, of course I do, because well, you they say, want of course, it so to be British. And that's the only criteria? Yeah. OK. When all those African countries that we dumped wanted to be British, do you think we should have kept them as well? Because they did want to be, many of them. I'm just talking about Gibraltar. Yes, I know, and I'm, I'm trying to expand the conversation. Not but, with... Yeah, but I'm just talking about Gibraltar. Yes, I know Gibraltar. you are, and I was trying to expand the conversation, but not with any success, obviously. I'm just talking about Gibraltar. Yeah, you said. I, I grasped that, and yeah. I'm grateful to I you for it. I don't want to talk about Africa. OK, well, we've started that. Gordon tells Thank me... To, Gordon tells me... Oh, well, never mind. Gordon tells me to ask you if you've been to Little Bay, uh, but unfortunately I can't, because you've gone. 0161228 I don't even know what Little Bay is, but I do have a clue which I think is cleverly hidden in its name. I think it's... I, 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 cannot, I cannot say for sure, but I suspect it is a bay. I suspect also that it's not very big. Um, I, did, I did, whilst my one day, and it wasn't a full day at that because we had to drive there and back, but I, I did wander about Gibraltar thinking... This is really naff. And also, we went to the... I think they were called the, the battery, the gun emplacements. And you had to walk through a tunnel that had been cut all the way through the rock. And I thought it was quite courageous of me, being claustrophobic. But they I went all the way through this tunnel for miles and miles, it felt like. And my mate banged his head and fell over. But that's probably less interesting to you than it is to me. He's a dentist. 
So it probably serves him right. I don't know. Are you going to the dentist in the tent, or the tentist, as it's called in one paper? Oh, oh, oh. From Freddie and the Dreamers to Oasis, celebrating Manchester music tonight at five in Manchester now with me, Steve Saul. Yeah. And what was the other one? Don't look back in anger. Oh, dear. And all the bits in between. No mention of the Ollies. They'll be there. 95.1 FM. DAB Digital Radio. And the World Wide Web. This is Manchester. BBC Radio Manchester. At one o'clock, a former Manchester City trainee is jailed for blackmailing a premiership footballer and Shannon Matthews' mother denies charges of kidnap. Rain is threatening to wash out Lancashire's match with Durham. It's wet and windy with heavy rain through the afternoon and temperatures peaking at a high of 15 Celsius. And taking its toll on the roads, the M6 looking very slow. Junctions 20 at Lim heading down towards Junction 18 at Holmes Chapel. Good afternoon, I'm Anna Dawson. An ex-Manchester City trainee goalkeeper who blackmailed a top premiership footballer has been jailed for 20 months. Ashley Timms from Middleton pleaded guilty to the charges last month. Catherine Murray's got more. The 22-year-old had demanded £15,000 from the star who can't be named for legal reasons. He'd made a series of threats to publish images from a video involving the footballer if the star didn't pay up. He admitted charges of making a series of unwarranted demands with menaces and was jailed at Manchester Crown Court today for 20 months. The mother of Shannon Matthews has pleaded not guilty to child abduction charges. Karen Matthews' partner, Michael Donovan, also denied the charges when they appeared at Leeds Crown Court. Karen Matthews had previously been charged with perverting the course of justice and child neglect. Shannon went missing for three weeks in February. There's fresh evidence about the soaring cost of food. The price of meat and fish has risen by 23% since the beginning of the year, according to research carried out for the BBC. Some items, including chicken breasts, ham and basmati rice, have gone up by more than 40%. Overall, the cost of a typical trolley of food has risen by 8%. It means a lot of families are having to watch the shopping bill more carefully. Well, these shoppers in Manchester are typical of many. Everything's gone up. Fresh food, tin food, everything. It's usually the things that I buy regular that seems to have gone. It's like my butter now, it's like, it used to be dead cheap, now it's not. Bread, milk, meat, meat. Meat's gone sky high, I can't believe the price of meat. Um, you know, it's just the basic things like, you know, the dairy and the, the meat products, it's just, I'm turning vegetarian I think, because it's, uh, it's too expensive to buy meat. A 21-year-old man charged with murdering a father of seven in Burnley has changed his plea to guilty five days into his trial. Mohammed Raja Shafiq was stabbed in a park in March. A teenager who denied manslaughter and violent disorder also changed his plea to guilty, while two others who'd previously denied violent disorder also now admit the charge. Labour MPs, trade unionists and charities are all rounding on the Prime Minister for ruling out cash handouts to low-income households struggling with rising energy bills. Gordon Brown said there won't be any short-term gimmicks or giveaways. Instead, he wants to promote energy efficiency measures. One Labour backbenchers warned the decision will have very serious consequences. And Patrick South from Age Concern says pensioners are angry the government won't be doing anything to help them. People are already struggling to pay their energy bills. The latest rise of price hikes has made that situation worse. Around about a third of pensioners will be in fuel poverty this winter. They they need help. They need something to help them get through the winter. They're going to face a very difficult choice between whether to heat their home or put food on the table. And Fred Dibner's Bolton home has failed to sell at auction. It was up yesterday with a guide price of between £250 and £300,000. But when no bids were offered, it was dropped to £130,000 to try to kick-start some interest to no avail. Now it's hoped the house, which has a blue plaque in recognition of the steeplejack who died in 2004, will sell privately. BBC Radio Manchester Sports. The rain has just ended hopes of any play on day three of Lancashire's game at Durham. An announcement's just been made that there'll be no play today with the home side on 284-3.
Newcastle's management structure has been compared to an orchestra with three conductors. That's the view of the League Managers Association Chief Executive Richard Bevan after Kevin Keegan resigned as manager. Mark Hughes doesn't think it'll be difficult to keep his players happy, though. The Manchester City boss thinks the arrival of new players like Robinho only makes everyone else in the squad work harder to impress. Joey Barton has arrived at the FA to face disciplinary hearing. That's after pleading guilty to a charge of violent conduct following a training ground assault on a former teammate. The incident occurred while he was at Manchester City. And there's a grand finale to the Super League season locally this evening. St Helens will be awarded the league leader's shield for the fourth year running. That's if they can avoid defeat against their arch rivals Wigan. BBC Radio Manchester. Satellite weather. With Eno Eritor. It's a wet and windy day with plenty of rain falling this afternoon and some of that rain will be fairly heavy and persistent in places, so much so that the Met Office has issued a severe weather warning for potentially 20 to 40 millimetres of rain accumulating in places this afternoon. So that could mean extra surface water on your roads. We also have the fresh easterly winds blowing through and temperatures are disappointing for this time of the year. It's a high of 15 Celsius. Bezik with you on the phones. 0161 228 2255. Well, it's all going jolly well, isn't it? 0161 228 2255. Radio Manchester at bbc.co.uk. And of course, you can text on 01. No, you can't. Oh, no. <laughs> O double seven eight six two oh six nine five one. I'm doing my best to get the hang of this job, but you know, it's still beyond me. Yeah. But you knew that. Yeah. Um, Alan, reforces and hotels. Perhaps the suggestion is to introduce legislation to prevent hoteliers and others discriminating on the basis of one's profession, whilst retaining the hotelier's right to refuse large groups of guests, whether squaddies, hen or stag groups, just a thought. That's probably, that's probably acceptable. I'm just trying to think. Dependent on one's profession. I mean, if you have any sense, you wouldn't want broadcasters in there. Dear God, you don't want them to be nicking the towels. Um, can you think of a profession? Just just so we, we put some deal with the suggestion with some respect. Um, it sounds like a solution. Yes, OK, you're, you're allowed. We're not going to allow groups, stag nights, hen nights and all the rest of it. Now, I can see the perfect reason for not allowing that, but any particular profession that you would not want you would want to allow people to discriminate against. Can you think of any such profession? Yeah. I mean, they have it in some pubs, don't they? You're not allowed in in your working clothes. Which is a bit of a bummer if you're the Queen, cos you, you dress quite nice, thanks to Hardy Amis. If a little old-fashioned. Uh, uh, Bill, <laughs> Bill, in a lot old-fashioned then. Bill in Macclesfield, are you, Bill? Yes, I'm very old-fashioned, you can say that. No, I was on about Her <laughs> Majesty, you, but you must you must aggrandise yourself in whatever way you can, Bill. Well, you're not far behind me, I can assure you. Ain't that the truth? <laughs> <laughs> Go on, mate. Yeah, um, this um, responsibilities and what have you regarding these remaining territories, um... You and I have co do, do have some... Uh, I've learned that we do share some beliefs. Um, it scares you know. me, Bill, it scares yeah, me. Yeah, yeah, it does. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it scares me <laughs> a bit. Uh, I've, I've had a bit of thought about it, actually. <laughs> but we'll confine ourselves to this. I've got a few <laughs> points, actually, so you'll have to bear with me a little while. All right, all right. run through them. First of all, let's get one thing straight. Everything comes down in human life is to power. Um, those with the biggest gun and the most influence will rule no matter what. Um, there's no real fair play. It's all down to that. Now, first of all, Argentina was once part of the Spanish colony of uh, South America, which was covered all South America apart from, I think, Brazil, which was colonised by the Portuguese. Um, Really, the only pe the only th the only connection with Argentina with the Falklands is it did become um, an independent nation from whence the uh, after the Spanish started to crumble, um, but funny for a short time because it's a very new nation, and I 
think that the Falklands came with Cook and that sort of time. So it's been British uh, for an awful, awful long time as far as modern history goes. Uh, and the only people to ever inhabit it have always been um, what you might call ethnic British. Now, first of all, Hong Kong doesn't compare at all because it's a totally different scenario. Um, it's ethnic, all ethnic are Chinese, basically, and it was also on a lease basis anyway. Now, we've also all, already seen the Russian reason for invading Georgia was because of ethnic Russians, um, their own people. We can't devoid ourselves, I know you tend to do, because what, a paper nationality to you is all, I think, Alan. Um, the bloodline doesn't count to you, does it? That's where you come over to me. Anyway, that's... Just, I, I don't that's, know what you mean by a bloodline, but, well, but you know, generally, I mean, no. No, no, no. <laughs> generally, no. Um, as far as worrying about an invasion from Argentina, I think in the modern term, for a very long time, you can forget it. Um, well, they couldn't invade now, anyway, because, one, they're pretty well bankrupt. Two... But their their reasons for let invading... Me finish on, okay, let me on. finish on, then you go can on. come on. First, first of all, we also uh, have built a uh, great cost, um, um, something of a runway, quite mm -hmm. a substantial one. Yeah. Um, and we also keep modern aircraft there. So the chance, and don't forget, this place is about seven or eight hundred miles away from the coastline of Argentina. Mm. It didn't, it didn't like next door. Yeah. It's a long way, a long, long way, and the chance of any invasion is virtually nil. Anybody setting out with a load of pretty antique ships will be sunk instantly. Um, secondly, we're building, or I think they're on the way with it now, spending billions on modern day aircraft carriers which will carry, uh, which will be the size, virtually the size of American aircraft carriers. Mm -hmm. There's no point in building them if we can't protect what is maybe, um, not only is it populated by a few thousand ethnic British, um, also, with global warming, the, the Antarctic may well become um, a, um, a viable place for whatever reason. I do not, I can't see into the future. Um, so there's no point in building these ships if they're just not going to do anything. But you know, if they can't protect what we've got remaining. Um, and the third, the last thing I want to say is nobody in the right mind gives away something that may be at some time of value to them. That is not politic real. Mm -hmm. And I can't imagine the United States, France, but, well, okay, Russia, but I, but not, anybody else in the right but mind Bill, giving away not, a territory. I'm not offering the suggestion that we cede Gibraltar, uh, sorry, Gibraltar to Spain, uh, cede the Falklands to Argentine. I, I, I'd perfectly happily cede it to independence. I'm not bothered. Oh, and well. my reasoning isn't that that it's economic suicide or otherwise it's just the injustice of it you say that it's a long way from the folk uh, fr from argentina 800 miles you're right it's a very 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 long way and that rather impairs in fact probably removes argentine's right to it but it's a bloody sight further from here well, and if I mean, we're using I mean, geography as a as an argument, then we lose. Distance shouldn't really come into it. Well, how it did. Away? You introduced how it. 800, eight, 800 <laughs> miles, you <laughs> said. Just a minute. How far away is Hawaii from the United States? Country? I have absolutely no idea, well, but, I, but, I know what I, but I know what I think about Hawaii being <laughs> a state of, the, of America. Yeah, yeah. I find this whole... I mean, I, my ideal would be to go in the other direction. I've said this before, and you and I will never agree on it, but I think we should have world government. Won't get it in my life or yours, but I think we should, and that would be a step towards a solution over all these boundary disputes. However, in the climate in which we currently live, I think nations owning, for want of a better term, small chunks of land, thousands and thousands and thousands of miles away from their land, is ludicrous. Utterly ludicrous. Well, I mean, this is the, this. I mean, if you look at the Antarctic, that's divided like a piece of cake into into various nations who, all, who own it. Hello. Yeah, I'm listening. Um, yeah. Um, there's certain, certain. I think there's about seven or eight nations who own who, who technically um, 
have got a, an agreement of some description. I don't know whether it's United Nations. I think it is United Nations registered who own the Antarctic. There, there, is, um, there is this mutual agreement uh, and some yeah. very, very strict... Um, occasionally they get broken, but some very, very strict rules about how it will be used, uh, chemical stories and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, that, that's, my, that's my view on it. Um, mm. I, mean, that's, all right. I mean, politics we are all, and it's different than politics um, imagined, isn't it? Well, politics so we are is very it. definitely different yeah. to politics <laughs> to politics principle. As the, as but, the Georgians have just found out. Uh, well, yeah, but I'm, I'm always... <laughs> steady now. I'm always, <laughs> always interested in looking at the rights and wrong rather than the till. <laughs> Yeah, I realise that, Alan. World government might be all right, but I'd have to, I'd have to know the, what's going on first. <laughs> the one thing we will know, Bill, just like now, is we'll never find out what's going on. <laughs> have a good weekend. Jane yeah. Inberry, are you, Jane? Hiya. What can we do for you? Well, I'm a bit upset how this lad's been treated. OK. It's this really very bad. As far as I'm concerned, I come from an army family and I feel so strongly about it, how they've treated that lad. And I think it should never happen again. Hello? Yeah, I'm listening, love, don't worry. It should never happen again. The poor lad was on his own. Hmm. And fancied to have to sleep in a car. Yeah, he did, he had to sleep in his car. But he's... I, I mean, let's not... We'll deal with the emotion of it, but he's a fit young man. Sleeping in his car won't do him any harm. No, I quite understand yeah. that. If yeah. I lived nearby, I would have put him up for free of charge. And I think many other persons would have done so also, without a doubt. But you say you come from a, a military family. Yeah, I do. You must know of incidents where military people have, should we say not exactly endeared themselves to the local civilian population. Right. Hello? Listen, uh, yeah, I'm listening. I'm, ju I'm just suggesting to you that you must know, you must know of occasions when the military, I don't mean as an entity, but members of the armed forces have um, behaved in a way that, frankly, you wouldn't want them in your premises. No, but... They're not the, all angels, are they? No, no, but if he was on his own, there's no excuse. No excuse whatsoever. Now, I'm going to say something, Good. and don't take it wrong. Don't you worry, I won't. Right. I like royal family, right? Now, what happened if Prince William or Prince Harry walked into that hotel? I think they'd let him in, don't you? Yes. I think they'd let him in. Yes. I, d I do indeed. Um, I'm not calling the royal family. No, I know you're not, but I, I agree with you. I think they would have let him in, and I think Her Majesty, who is, of course, the head of all the military, would be allowed in as well. Yes, and, and to me, who, and the manager, I don't, uh, to me, I think he's a coward that he couldn't come out and mm. speak about it. Well, the, the, man, the duty manager who was asked for wasn't available. And, oh, and, what a tale. Well, well we, we have to be careful here, because I don't want to malign the person when we have no evidence that he deserves it. Now, first of all, the hotel says that that is not and has not been their policy. The hotel have apologised to the individual. The person who made the decision and said that it was hotel policy was the one, the woman working on reception, and when asked to get the duty manager, didn't try to contact the individual, just said, he's not available. Yeah. So we can't criticise the duty manager for that because he can't know this is going on in his hotel unless somebody tells him, and apparently the woman did not. So let's, we don't need to criticise him. And the policy, according to the hotel management, the policy has never existed. Oh, right. And it was just that individual um, misunderstood the policy. Now, uh, Well, she I, wasn't very well trained then, was she? Well, that, do, that does sound like it. Or, or somebody's telling lies, and I've no idea who... Um, and, and it might indeed be nobody, but somebody could very easily be telling lies. I mean, he was going to see a friend that was hurt anyway. Yes, he was. He was. Uh, and I think it's disgusting, and I think it should never happen again. Believe me, I'm very proud of these lads. Very, very proud. And Good it on should you, Jane. Ne never happen again. OK, well, the, the publisher that this has got, it may well bring it out that it won't happen again. Good on you, Jane. Thank you very much indeed. Right, thank you. And Derek in Lee says, I'm told tonight is the final of Big Brother. As a social experiment, I'll watch this televisual treat, if you will.
Oh, sod it, I can't lie. I'd rather let Gary Glitter date my daughter than view such puerile tosh. Derek in me, that seems a little harsh. Um, and I never knew you had a daughter. I'll be tuning in to see Saints stuff the pie eaters. Proper gravy. I have no idea what proper gravy means, and I'm now right quite worried. This is the Northwest's biggest sports station. This is BBC Radio Manchester. With no Premier League action this weekend, the Football League takes centre stage. It's going to be the goal! It is! The U scores! We've got reporters at all our Football League games. And it's going to be the goal! That's Oldham, Macclesfield, Ferry, and Rochdale. LaFondry steps up right footed and scores! The all-new Manchester Sports from one o'clock tomorrow. BBC Radio Manchester. Stuart in Berry says, just to let you know, I attended the first night production of Brast Off at the Oldham Coliseum last night. It was absolutely fabulous. Fabulous. It was absolutely fabulous and well worth a mention. So there you are. The production features live local brass bands who really add quality to the play. I know you don't usually do this sort of thing, but as the production involves the local non-professional bands, maybe they deserve a mention. And they do. The only downside is that Bernard Wrigley's in it. You can't have everything. It's press night tonight. I'm going on Tuesday. 20 past one on BBC Radio Manchester. News headlines, Anna Dawson. An ex-Manchester City trainee goalkeeper who blackmailed a top premiership footballer has been jailed for 20 months. Ashley Timms from Middleton had pleaded guilty to the charges last month. The mother of Shannon Matthews has pleaded not guilty to child abduction charges. Karen Matthews' partner, Michael Donovan, also denied the charges when they appeared at Leeds Crown Court. Shannon disappeared for three weeks in February. There's fresh evidence about the soaring cost of food. New figures figures for the BBC show the price of meat and fish has risen by 23% since the beginning of the year, with other foods like pasta rising 40%. Manchester's weather wet this afternoon, highs of 16 Celsius. Have we got the word on mung beans for the vegetarians? How are they doing? Do we know? I mean, we can't leave them out, you know, there'll be letters. Well, the price may stay the same, but the wind won't. <laughs> <laughs> BBC Radio Still in the weather now. 2020 traffic. We've had an accident. It's where we had the heavy rain in that queue. Junctions 20 down to 17. The accident itself on the M6 southbound between 20 at Lim and 19 at Natsford. One lane is closed. The traffic is looking very heavy on the approaches there. Two vehicles have been involved. Both of them stuck in lane three. Anything else, you can give me a call if it's safe to do so. It's 0161 244 4951. I'm Warner Merchant. 2020 traffic means you get an update every 20 minutes through the day. Teddy Mosson says, if I was the governor of Gibraltar, I'd turn the guns towards Spain. You'd have to move the mountain, because they're all... The, gu the gun emplacements were all there to protect the, the co to, to protect that, that little inlet. I don't know what it's called. The something straits, probably. Anyway, Gibraltar straits, venture. Um, it's for that, so the guns are all on the other side. Yeah, so the mountain would be in the way. It's not much of a mountain. John, in Wigan, are you, John? Afternoon, Alan. Afternoon, sir. Uh, this pension, this uh, fuel payment debate that's been on the radio. Oh, yes. It, the one that's, uh, I'm recently qualified on this, so I have a personal interest. Uh, is it the one that people get £200 was last year, wasn't it? Um, and the year before? Yeah. Uh, does that mean there won't be one this year, or is it not an annual thing automatically? I'm, I'm not sure, but I... I presumed that that one was still on and that the one that's being discussed is one that's been called for by some politicians saying in fact one of the local politicians if we count Chorley as local has been saying much that today uh, Lindsay Hoyle has been saying the government should do something to help pensioners who are uh, struggling to pay their electricity bills and I think we're referring to matters Another one. On some, top of the some, one they are something top. extra. I think that's what's been. So all these pension about. millionaires who are uh, going to get the two hundred pound will get another a bit as well. Well, only if the government decides that it will, and the government seems to have said you can never be quite sure what governments say, but they seem to have said no, there won't be any specific grant help to. Um, to so all to these rich pensioners who are living all living off, uh, I mean that's five dollars a year and. Running around in the BMWs, all get yes. two hundred pound plus, and then 
Uh, well, they, they well no, they won't. As I keep saying, they've said they're not going to do it. But oh, right, sorry. the the plan was, or the suggestion was that they should well, you, I, you either increase that that do, grant or put do, something do, to. Do you think the people should get the two hundred pound anyway? Do I think they will, or do I think do they, they should? should? Um, I have a difficulty with that question because I don't think we should be giving one-off grants to retired people. No. Any of them. I don't think we should give them one-off grants at all. Well, I, I think it's agree a with you. I think it's a disgusting insult, and the only reason oh, we're doing it... Oh, right, on that basis. The would, only reason we're doing it... I would attack it from the other side. Well, I... The, my, the, I, the, 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 the pensioners are probably the richest... Per, probably the richest um, area of society. Well, when you say the pensioners... Yeah, but, but you, you might be... Well... I don't know how you define rich, so it's very tricky. Well, they, had, they bought the houses for nothing, and they've accumulated. Well, you see, quite to, quite a lot of houses. pensioners didn't buy their houses because they couldn't. Quite a lot did. Yeah, well, we're talking about the rich, and I don't think the general concept of a pensioner is a rich person. But I do concede that many of them are. Are they also in pension schemes that? Uh, paid, um, Again, many of them are. Dexling pensions. But e no, not in, they don't yes, exist now. Many of them are, yeah. but many of them aren't. Yeah, but the, the, I, would, I think that the, the fact that people with hundreds of thousands in, in collateral and in the bank are yes. getting 200 pounds and tickling to themselves, because I. I've, I've had conversations with people I know who are pensioners and they, they have a little smirk on their face and they say, they've got to come out with a quip about, I'll go and spend me £200 now. And they're riding around in, they're riding around in fancy cars with nice houses and thousands in the bank. Indeed. And you may be absolutely correct on that. So How, send them 200, however... We say totally don't need, well, and then £200, that £200 that they're getting... Well, if you're saying that none of them... £200 that they're getting, somebody else if you're who saying, it could have it. If you're saying that none of them should get it, well, then, because they don't well, need it, so then there are those that would argue... Who are by not, somebody who genuinely needs it. Well, the problem here is... And you may not accept this figure, but you might have to just listen for a minute yeah, while I explain the problem. The problem is, if you decide that you're going to only give the money to those who need it, you then have to decide how that decision will be made. You then have to employ people to make that decision. And you end up, instead of giving everybody £200 and those that don't need it getting it, but those that do do. Instead of that, you end up that those that need it get in a tenner apiece because you've spent all the money working out who should get it. Well, they, have, they have statistics on people who are on... You need to come back to the microphone. They have statistics on people yes, who, they do who have are on means-tested benefits yes, already. Yes, they do have such statistics. But why would they need to research more? Because, they, they because there the... are some people who are just 30 pence above the means-tested benefit and if they say you get it if you're on means tested benefits but not if you're on 30 pence above those benefits again you miss out a lot of people who actually need it no, it is you, cheaper no, i mean believe give me it, give it to Look, people who are within within within, within, John, within, John, within 25 John, pounds of the means tested John, benefit then John, making decisions costs money it costs a lot of money and you say they have those figures and yes they have there are something like, I think the last figure I read was 10 million pensioners in our society. And whilst it would be easy to find out how many of those 10 million are on means tested, what it wouldn't be easy to do would find out who they are. Because that would mean 10 million decisions. Because you'd go to Mr Jones, you go to Mr Smith, and you would have to make the decision in every one of those cases. And if you then decided that, okay, of the 10 million, 3 million get the payment, you would then have 3 million bank transactions. You would then have 3 million letters. All of these letters would have to be written by somebody. They would have to be posted by somebody. They're doing that anyway to everybody. No, they're not doing that anyway. This would be another decision. Well, no, the, and every, decisions cost no, money. Everybody's, everybody's over the, the age of qualifying is, yes. is being sent letters anyway. Yes, they are. 
And if you want those letters to stay as they are, it's free. But if you want to change them, it costs money. Well, they still have to be paid for those letters. Yes, they do. But at the moment, they are written. If you write them again, All right. who's going to do it? Oh, well, just send them the ordinary letter. Don't mention the eating allowance. But it's about the eating allowance. Yes, but you can't afford to mention it. Don't ask them about it. I'll just give them the bloody money. It's cheaper to give the 200 quid to everybody right. than it is to decide who's really entitled to it. Uh, Believe me, that is true. Well, for a comment. Uh, but just make one more, a couple of more points. Might be fair, but it took ten minutes. Go on. I didn't think, I didn't think Manchester City had trade any goalkeepers, from my experience. Right. Well, I'm, I, I mean, I'm sure that's humorous. Well, but it's out of my. It's out, you're from Wigan. What do you know? It's, <laughs> it's out of my depth. Said this training Manchester goalkeeper he's been sent down for. Yeah, and I know the story. Yeah. I just, uh, I, it was just the the joke. I couldn't. Yeah. Have a good day. <laughs> <But I'll, laughs> Are you going to beat St. Helens tonight? Uh, oh, go on. To, uh, well, listen, the coupon, the coupon says. The, the coupon says that we're going to going to get a 14 start, and if he carries on really like this. Uh, I don't think um, I don't think Alan Murphy could play well in these conditions. And the scrap, there's another one. The scrap man came round yesterday. Shouted, he was stood on the biggest wagon I've ever seen. Yeah. Bar on the back, and then he had a, bar, had a bod on the back, shouting rag bone. Rag bone. Been one of them for a while. No, my word, that, that was, was fantastic. It, was he giving donkey stones? And <laughs> Oh, he's that big that took a car on the back. <laughs> Who's yeah, giving that? <laughs> That's probably just for him getting home. Good on you, John. <laughs> one six one two two eight double two double five. Uh, Terry in Tilsley. Sal Alan, would the same response be coming if this hotel had banned all bus conductors? I think not. Well, OK, but bus conductors don't put their life on the line every day. Unless, of course... <laughs> Let's, of course, they're on the last run. Uh, Walter in Romilly. Hi, Walter. Good day, Alan. Good day. Um, squaddy behaviour. Yes. Uh, I think Kipling had it summed up. He said, We are not thin red heroes, nor are we blackguards too, but single men in barracks, most remarkably like you. And if at times our conduct isn't all your fancy paint, well, single men in barracks don't grow into plaster saints. Mm. And I think that just about sums it up for Well, me. It, it does, doesn't it? Yeah. It's I mean, I, I, we went up to Barnard... I was six years in the colours, and we went up to Barnard Castle for uh, toughening up training and what have you, and in the same town was a Scottish regiment who shall be nameless. And every Saturday night... Uh, in the dance hall, there was a bloodbath. <laughs> it was absolutely... I had know. much the same experience <laughs> with the Royal Irish Rangers <laughs> in Catterick. Right. Dear God, they, I mean, if they you came two, back from abroad and we all the If you get two tables. regiments in the same town, if you had two regiments in the same town, by God, you had trouble, did you not? Well, my, my favourite story of such things is there was a, a Royal Marine... Uh, uh, sorry, a Royal Marine stood at the bar and the, the ship was in, the American ship was in, I won't tell you where, but it very nearly made the papers. Some ingenuity of a local commanding officer prevented it getting out. But he was stood there in uniform at the bar and an American came up to him and tapped him on the shoulder and said, what's the RM for on your shoulder? And he said... Real Marine. <laughs> yeah. All hell let loose. <laughs> sure it did. I wouldn't want to buy the bar the barrack damages for that. <laughs> no, you wouldn't, night. would you? No, indeed. <laughs> they are not all cherubs. Good on you, Walter. Cheers, Alan. Have a good day. Bye -bye. Oh one six one two two eight double two double five. If you've something to say, tell Manchester via this. Yeah, dead easy. <laughs> you can do it via email as well. Radio Manchester at bbc.co.uk and you can text on 07786 206 951. David says, as an ex squaddy, there are some soldiers I wouldn't let in any hotel I owned. I saw the pictures of all the squalid conditions in the married pads. Who did that damage? The problem is when they all get classed the same. I mean, for example, do you remember the story just a few years back now, maybe not even as long as that, but just a while back. Do you remember the story of the, the squaddies on trial in um, Cyprus 
for, um, should we say, for alleged, alleged troubles. Yes. Alleged troubles. There were all sorts of things. I mean, squaddies are like everybody else in that there are some things that, um, well, that are not very tidy. Barry in Worsley. Hiya, Barry. Hi, Alan. What have you got? Just a quickie. This that uh, this guy was on about this two hundred pounds each for heating allowance. Yes. Well, it isn't that. It's two hundred pounds per household. Yeah. So I mean, like, there's two of us live here, and we get a hundred pounds each. Right. We don't get two hundred pounds each. So, hang on. So you just said we did. You mean we don't? <laughs> the, the... No. It's per Yes, yeah, so there are two retired people in your property. Yes. And you only get one. We get one hundred One, pounds one each. grant. So well, well no, you get one grant of 200 quid, yes. don't you? Yeah, effectively. But the way he was saying that you get 200 pounds each. Yes, but I think he was, I mean, yes, you're right no, to, you're you right know, to correct You know, him. when it's different, that's what I'm trying yeah. to say. Yeah. Um, and also that he's sort of saying about, you know, whether people need it. And I know I'm 66, I retired just over 12 months ago. Yeah. I don't need it. But oh, by God, I'll tell you what, Alan, I've worked hard for 50 years, I've paid in society, and I will have it. Yeah, you know? but, but the purpose of the benefit was, and, and I mean, I know I had an argument with John about uh, the costings of it, but the purpose of the benefit was to alleviate the risk, or hopefully remove the risk, of having pensioners freeze to death in their homes. Oh, yeah. Now, the government decided, as I, I went through rather laboriously, that's me, not him, with John, explaining why they decided to pay it via the process that yes. they did. But to say, I've worked hard for it, well, I'm sorry, that's not an argument. You didn't work hard so that you could get £200 once a year. No. You worked I, hard because no. you didn't have a bloody choice. No, all right, I didn't do that. But what I'm saying is, there's no way I will turn around and say, oh, well, don't bother giving it because I don't need it. Well, nobody it. else would either. You know. I mean, it, I... I I become 60 quite soon. I feel sure the following year I'll get my cheque. I'll probably, I'll probably give it away. Well, there you are. I mean, but that's because that's, that's that's I could. You know, we're just making a, di a presumption here that I'll even be in work this time next year. But if I'm still in work next year, I won't need it either. Well, I mean, you know, that's, that's, uh, well, uh, well, that's fair enough. I mean, if you want to be charitable, but I certainly wouldn't give it away. No, well, that's fine. But because there's that many people who are ripping this government off and getting money that they don't deserve and everything else, and people who genuinely do deserve it, are entitled to it, as far as I'm concerned, should just jolly well have it. Well, yes, absolutely. But we, we must at least try to make it equitable. And my... My complaint always about retirement pension is that the state retirement pension is offensive. It's offensive in that it's too small an amount. And I would pay every retired pensioner, whether they worked all their lives or not, I would pay every one of them a sum not far from, in fact probably equal to, the minimum wage. Well, and I, I mean, I and then, that. and then, I would make the ones like you, and hopefully in the future me, pay bloody tax on their income. I pay tax on my income. Well, there you are. So I would say that everything you have above a certain amount, whether you earn it or are given it by the government, is taxed. That's what I would say. But I would make sure that the retirement pension is enough for a human being yeah. to live off. Yeah. And unfortunately, no government since about the 60s has felt that to be the case. Well, exactly. So it's probably not going to happen. So all I say is until it does happen, you know, get everything you can, whether you're in... Well, I, I'm, not, I'm not a member of the Get Everything You Can Brigade, well, but I, I am a member of... Alan, I've worked 50 years and I have not claimed... I've never had a day off... Well, that's not true. I've, well, I did when I had some hip replacements. And that's the only time I've had time off work. I've never had anything off the sick, off the social, off anything. Well, well done you. Look at you. Look at you. Well, OK, look at me. I've been employed for 50 years and everything and so mm. therefore that's why I you know I mean I can hold my head up high and it doesn't bother me at all getting the, the well I'm, the I'm not asking you to hold your head in any direction high or low oh. I, I personally personally think that I'm, I'm not bothered about these sorts of benefits that are just handed out because there's not much not much point to discuss you will receive it full stop but I am concerned about people who don't claim benefits we used to call them supplementary, supplementary benefits and without wanting to give them that title, but benefits that are claimable, means-tested benefits, the number of people who don't 
claim those annoys me. It annoys me because by not claiming them, they allow the government to perpetrate and, and repeat the lie that there are people that don't need them. And, and I would have everybody claim every benefit to which they're entitled, and if they don't need it when they get it, give it away. Well, they just clear that to them, then, as an individual. Absolutely so. Do whatever they wish. Good on you, Barry. Well, okay. don't spend it all in one shop, unless it's my shop, and I haven't got a shop, so just send it to me. Right, all right. Have a good day. <laughs> Cheers. 0161 228 If you want to join us, that is absolutely fantastic. Of course it is. Alan, read your caller, John, who was twittering on and, and wanted to keep are old in the cold and didn't understand the cost of means testing. If he got the payment and decided he was not in need, he could donate it to charity or even send it back. Dear God, Malcolm, we don't want him sending it back. Donate it to charity. Do what you like with it, but don't, for God's sake, send it back. You would throw a spanner in the works. Could you imagine if you sent the cheque back? That would require about 15 different people to sort that mess out. <laughs> Don't do that, for God's sake. 20 to 2, Radio Manchester News Headlines. Rachel Ferguson. A former Manchester City trainee goalkeeper who blackmailed a top premiership footballer has been jailed for 20 months. Ashley Timms from Middleton had already pleaded guilty to trying to get £15,000 from the player. The mother of Shannon Matthews has pleaded not guilty to child abduction charges. Karen Matthews' partner, Michael Donovan, also denied the charge when they appeared at Leeds Crown Court. Shannon disappeared for nearly three weeks in February. And there's fresh evidence about the soaring cost of food. New figures for the BBC show the price of meat and fish has risen by 23% since the beginning of the year, with other foods like pasta rising 40%. Manchester's weather are wet and miserable this afternoon, highs of 16 Celsius. BBC Radio Manchester, 2020 traffic. We've had an accident on the M6 heading south from Junction 20, that's Lim, heading towards 19 at Nutsford. There's a lane closure in place. It's lane three, the outside lane that's being closed off. Two vehicles are still stuck there by the look of things, and traffic is looking very slow on the approaches. Everything else pretty much OK with no major problems. If you do spot anything else, you can always give me a call, and it's 0161 244 I'm Orna Merchant. BBC Radio Manchester. Sports with Bill Wright. And we start with cricket, but unfortunately there will be no more play on day three of Lancashire's County Championship match with Durham. BBC Radio Manchester's Chris Maliband has been there watching the rainfall. This match is heading for a range-ruined draw after umpires Richard Illingworth and Nigel Cowley took the inevitable decision to abandon play for the day around about 40 minutes ago. With just one day left in the game, a positive result is impossible. And with the forecast for rain to continue through this afternoon and evening, the chances of any further cricket in the match appear slim. So it seems Lancashire will take just five points from the fixture, meaning it's just 12 from their last three championship games. It's likely that the Red Rose will go into the final two games of the season, exactly level on points with Yorkshire in joint second bottom place in the Division 1 table. Stuart Law will hope for better weather at Egbeth and Taunton as his side fight hard to stay up and the Lancashire captain is becoming mightily fed up with the weather gods. Well, I'm sick of the rain. You know, it, at times uh, I can understand why you know people do silly things to themselves in this part of the world when you spend winter in dark gloomy conditions and then during summer you very rarely get a, you know, a patch of blue sky and you know sunshine so uh, it's been frustrating, it's been horrible. So no play for Lancashire today and Andrew Flintoff has been critical of their decision to release Dominic Cork at the end of this season. He said he'd be one of my first names on the team sheet and one of the best things that could now happen is for someone to turn around and tell him we've made a mistake and keep him. Flintoff joins Captain Stuart Law who had already criticised the cricket committee for not consulting him about the decision. An orchestra with three conductors is what Richard Bevan has compared Newcastle United to. The chief executive of the League Managers Association was responding to Kevin Keegan's decision to resign as manager yesterday. No such concerns for the Manchester City boss Mark Hughes, though. He doesn't think it'll be difficult for him to keep all his players happy with Robinho's arrival and other big names targeted when the transfer window reopens in January. Hughes thinks that the signing of the Brazilian only makes the players in the squad more keen to impress. The fact that we've been able to bring Robinho has, has made everybody in the squad happy because what it does is raise the bar, it uh, raises ex expectation and, and everybody has to obviously raise their game. It's fantastic because uh, we've got a group of players that obviously were going in the right direction even before the uh, introduction of the, the money from Abu Dhabi. So now we've got a real, really focused group that uh, will kick on, I'm sure. 
It's not just at the top of the tree that managers are feeling the pressure, it's also a problem in the Football League. The Oldham boss John Sheridan shouldn't have too much to worry about with his side joint top of League One, but he admits that it's much tougher as a coach than it was as a player. Players are selfish. You look after yourself when you're a player, definitely. I still, I'm still early days as a manager. I'm learning, hopefully I'm learning all the time. I think I am. I think I'm going the right way and oh, it's lots of hard work and dedication. You've got to work very hard to... It's about results at the end of the day, and if you can get results, good results, everyone's happy. Joey Barton is about to learn his fate at the Football Association after pleading guilty to a charge of violent conduct following a training ground assault of a former teammate, Osman Dabo. That was when the two players were both at Manchester City. Barton could receive a lengthy ban on top of his four-month suspended sentence. St Helens can clinch the league leaders' shield tonight if they avoid defeat against arch-rivals Wigan at Knowsley Road. For the Warriors, victory could earn them a home tie in the playoffs, so coach Brian Noble knows that there's plenty riding on the result. This weekend we'll decide who's fourth, fifth and sixth, who's one and two, and we know who three is. Uh, that's solid. And so, yeah, we, we still have got a heck of a lot to play for. We'd love a home tie, uh, but again, that's out of our... What's in our hands is consolidating our fifth position. Sales Andrew Sheridan and Rory Lamont face late fitness tests ahead of tomorrow's uh, ahead of Sunday's Premiership opener at Newcastle. However, Matthew Tate against his former club and Dwayne Peel will make their debuts. Sebastian Bruno is ruled out with a knee injury. And Amir Khan has weighed in at nine stones seven and a half pounds for his WBO Intercontinental lightweight title defence against Bredis Prescott in Manchester tomorrow night. And Andy Murray's US Open semi-final with Rafa Nadal could be disrupted by bad weather. Organisers are concerned that the remnants of Tropical Storm Hannah could arrive in the New York area tomorrow. The next live action on the Northwest's biggest sports station. We'll have full match commentary of St. Helens against Wigan in the Super League tonight and all the news of Rochdale's playoff game against York. That's in the all-new Manchester Sports from 7. Radio Manchester. <laughs> Alan, Johnny Wigan is right. Alex Murphy would struggle to compete in tonight's game <laughs> in this inclement weather. But then Murph is in his late 60s. Yeah, he's still better than some of the ones out there now, isn't he? Cracking player, Murphy. Not a bad coach either. There you are. Uh, good morning, Alex. Hope you're well. Uh, Bridey in New Moston. Hiya. Hello, Alan. You all right? Yes, not so bad. I've calmed down now while I've been waiting. <laughs> I'm sorry about that. No, it's not your fault. I'm sorry um, you've calmed down. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Go on. Right. Well, I think it was John that was going on about the pensioners with a BMW. The fuel payment. Yeah, yeah yes. your BMW and your, your, right. your house well, in Spain, these, yes. These pensioners that have BMWs, which probably isn't many anyway, mm. have probably worked all their lives for it. And they've got pensions because they've worked all their lives. Mm. Now, they, oh, and to upset him more, I tell him it's not 200 this year, it's 300 this year because they're giving him £50 extra as a one off. So that'll upset him a bit more. All right. Right. So I worked since I was 14, and I'm nearly 70 now. I worked for, till I was 65. I had two pensions because I worked. I pay everything full, council tax a lot. We have a car, but we work for it. And we don't go on holiday because we can't afford it. So what about these people who have never worked, don't want to work, and never will work, that well, have cars? You see, Bridie, the, the difficulty here is that, that you're almost, almost agreeing with John. I'm not agreeing. Ah, you John. see, you, you say he's you're not. saying that the pensioners shouldn't get it. I don't see why they should. Well, be. he's saying that they shouldn't get it because they don't need it. Well, a lot of people do need it. Ah, but you see, that's the even point. Even though they've got a BMW, but John, why should, even if they've got a BMW, but why John, shouldn't they get it? Well, they we're not. Do, but John, John, uh, John's point was. Bridie, John's point was that there are some pensioners that don't need it. Now, if you're saying, oh, they're old and they've worked hard, therefore give them 200 quid, well, why not make it 20,000? Why not make well, it a million? Not? Exactly, why well, not? Well, but, saying, well, but the purpose of the winter fuel payment was so that pe pensioners did not freeze to death in winter. That's that true, was the yes. point. Well, you're not going to freeze to death. No, because I can't afford to go on holiday. It don't I... matter. You still wouldn't freeze to death. Well, no. Because and neither I've would got John. Two pensions because I've but, worked for but it. But that's the point he makes. Well, he... The thing is, the thing is, these people who have never worked 
have cars, go on holiday and get Bridie, that money. Bridie, Do you think they're entitled to it Bridie, as well? I, it's not my view we're discussing here. I think the winter fuel payments is a stupid idea and a cowardly idea and the government should be bloody well ashamed of itself for doing it. I wouldn't give a winter fuel payment to anybody. No, because I think it's bloody... Exactly so. I think it is downright offensive and a cowardly, snivelling, pettifogging way of a government to behave, if you yes, want my view. Got, but, 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 I also agree with John that there are pensioners who do not need it. Now, I'm not saying they aren't justly entitled to it, which is entirely different. I'm saying they do not need it. A lot of them do need it. Indeed Listen, so. Listen, I've got two pensions. John. But John's but point... I leave, I've been leaving... Bridie, 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 Bridie. Let me try and explain what John was saying. Go on. He was saying that there are some pensioners who do not need it. Do you agree with that simple statement? Yes. Are there some yes, pensioners? Yes. Right. So, when he said there are some pensioners who do not need it, you agree? Yeah. Right. There are some pensioners who very, very definitely need it because yes. they are walking around with holes in their shoes. That's true, do you yes. agree with that? I do, yes. Right. Now, what John was saying was that we should have some process of deciding where the line is, where we decide those who do need it and those who don't. Well, would you say that the same thing about a lot of people are not working and they're still not hard up? Well, those people... Would you still think the same? I'm not thinking anything. I'm offering to you an explanation of what John said, because earlier I said to you, you actually agree with John, and you said, no, I don't, and I've just demonstrated to you that actually you do. Well, he was going on about them going around in BMWs. These BMWs are probably very old ones anyway. But why shouldn't they? Why shouldn't they go around and they work for Well, OK. And why well, well they listen, pension listen, like the rest? listen to this. A pal of mine, a pal of mine yeah. is a businessman. Been a businessman all his life. Yeah. He's worth somewhere in the region of £120 million. Pounds. He's 63. He doesn't need it. Right. He'll probably get it. Yeah, you're right. Do you think he should? He's well, worked harder than you, I promise you. He works... Yeah, well... Uh, rich people work bloody well, hard yes, most of the time. He's well, worked he bloody yeah, well, he hard. He probably doesn't need it, but he'd probably give it away anyway. Well, we don't know what he'd do with it. No. My question isn't, do we give it to him and say, there you are, give that to Oxfam. What we say to him is, you're over 60, here's your money. Well... Should we? No, I don't think he'd claim it anyway. Well, should we? He's entitled to it. Should he be entitled to it? Well, yeah. He's got money coming out of his ears. Why shouldn't he? He's paid more than you in. Paid well, more than me in. He's paid, has. paid he's more than you in. He's paid more than me in. He's paid more than you and me earn in. Yeah, he probably has. But... Well, he has. I know he has. But, but, but... Should he be entitled to it? Yes. Why? Because even royals are entitled to it, aren't they? They don't accept well, it, but they're entitled to it. I've no idea, but my question... It, my, I mean, we don't need to it, introduce yeah. royalty. My question is, should he be entitled to it? That's the question. Should he, not the Ma Her Majesty the Queen, nor even old Mother Riley, yeah. should he, with his 120 million quid, be entitled to 200 quid off the government? Paid for, given that you've got two pensions, probably, some of it, by your tax... Well, yeah. Should they is. be taking money off you in tax to give him 200 quid? Well, yeah, because he's entitled to it, yeah. My, but my question isn't... <laughs> my question... You see, the government decides who's entitled to what. My question is, should he be entitled to it? Well, no, not if they have a means test, but they don't have a means test. Do, do you think we should have? Yeah. OK, that I precisely, that, 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 that Bridie, Bridie, that is precisely what John said. That is exactly what John said. We should oh. have a means test. Oh, then I won't call him then. <laughs> <laughs> you call him if you want, love. <laughs> hey, have a belter. All and right. don't spend it all at once when you get it. Right. Cheers, See love. Bye-bye now. Life, life and laugh with Eamon and Jimmy. If Intelligent Life is trying to contact us, why do they keep taking the people into the spaceships from trailer parks in the Appalachian Mountains? Why don't they go to somewhere where people can 
count only up to five on one hand. Amen, Jimmy. This phrase actually originated in 1932, this dirty rat thing, uh, in the film Taxi, in which Cagney said, come out and take it, you dirty yellow-bellied rat, or I'll give you something through the door. Since you've got a bit of world's longest catchphrase in a minute, there's you dirty double-crossing yellow-bellied rat. <laughs> Shoot you through the door. <laughs> I'll give you a blast through your hinges. If your radio sounds funny on Sunday morning, you must be listening to Eamon O'Neill and Jimmy Wag. Obvious, but funny. <laughs> Sunday morning from 9. At BBC Radio Manchester. You're very really good day. How are you? I'm up to here with eating allowance now, me. Up to here with it. Marion in Blakely. Hiya, Marion. Hiya, Alan. What have you got? Um, Friday said most of it. <laughs> you say it again, don't you worry. Hey, like her, I could this have This is a BBC, the... we're glad it of was... repeats. Go it on, love. I could have got down the, th the phone at him and I've had him by the throat. <laughs> However, <laughs> but, do you, um, but so, having having heard Bridey eventually agree with him, do you? No, no, All I, right. I don't because we can apply it to everything. You know, forget the pensions. I'm one of them that worked till I was sixty-eight and all the rest of it. Yeah, and don't claim a penny. And I'm not a millionaire. But what about all these people with loads and loads of money that are claiming child allowance? Should they send it back? Well, I don't know. You tell me. Well, no, it, it, you know, they, they've got their fortunes to make. Yes. You know, in our day, and, and this is one of the things, you know, the rich pensioners, the mm. cheeky... I'm not going to swear, although I've, I have done, <laughs> while I was listening to have it. you really? <laughs> yeah. Six weeks old, my kids were, when yeah. I went back to work. I didn't yeah. have a choice. I no, mean, said know. that, Alan, you know, in a cigarette factory, six yeah. while ten. My husband walked in, I walked out. Didn't yeah. have a choice. And that place was run by people, I'm 72 now, of my age, that were doing exactly the same. Oh, absolutely. To be a rich pensioner. Is he bloody joking? It, it was his arrogance. But they, but rich pensioners do exist. Of course they do, And Alan. should they get 200 quid out the till? They should, you, like you said, the farms and God knows what yeah. and everything like that. Mm. But you must apply it to anybody on, that's getting benefit of All any right. kind All if, right. if you're going to do well that. retirement pension is of course a benefit so so that goes to everybody if you're going to do it if you're going to have this sort of it's not a one-off because they've repeated it but this sort of instant benefit as it were then the only way to do it is the way they do and that's give it to everybody in a certain group yeah. Every retired I mean, pension. It, it every... applies to child allowance. I yep. know loads of people that don't need that. Mm, so we do didn't I. Get it. You like, got... in, in fact, I think child allowance should be phased out forthwith. You know, but I wonder how many, if he has got children, and I wonder if he took it and said thank you very much. I'm sure he did. Exactly. Good so, on you. Cheers, yeah. Marion. <laughs> Cheers. Don't, uh, once again, I say, don't spend it all at once. No. And Bye, don't, Alan. whatever you do, don't spend it on the electric. Um, the, I, I, read from, I read from a government website, the Pension Service, which is part of the Department of Work and Pensions, because there's now some confusion, mainly created and caused by me, obviously, over who does and who does not get winter fuel payment. The government will again be making winter fuel payments to most people aged 60 or over for winter 2008-9. That's the one we're just about to start. Indeed, judging by the weather, we started about a bloody month ago. A winter fuel payment is an annual payment to help people age 60 and over with the costs of keeping warm this winter. If you are 60 to 79 and you're entitled to receive a winter fuel payment this year, you will get either £125 or £250, depending on your circumstances, in the qualifying week. 15th to the 21st of September. If you are aged 80 over or over and you're entitled to a winter fuel payment this year, you will either to you will get either 200 or 400 depending on your circumstances in the qualifying week. You do not pay tax on winter fuel payments. If you need to make a claim for a payment for the following year, winter 2008-2009, you should return your claim form on or before the 30th of March 2009. In line with the change to state pension age for women, the qualifying age for winter fuel payments will rise gradually between 2010 and 2020 from 60 to 65. This means that from the winter of 2010-11 onwards, both men and women will need to have reached women's state pension age by the end of the September qualifying week. I hope you wrote that down because, frankly, 
I'm not reading it again because it was boring. Unless, of course, you're the one getting the brass. But there it is. It says, depending on your circumstances, in the qualifying week, 15 to 21st of September, in the time-honoured government way, it doesn't tell you what circumstances they'll be taking into consideration. But I think if you've got grey hair, you get it. Providing you're within the age criteria. I'm back tomorrow, early doors, 6 till 9. And then, of course, back here on Monday, 12 till 2, doing whatever it is we do, sat in this chair. Never quite fathom it. Ta-da now. How do you arrange a wedding?